Good evening, church. Well, we continue our series here, and uh, the questions that uh, people have been asking, I uh, do want to repeat, I really do appreciate the questions that you have put forth. They're a wide range, they're a very broad scope, and they are uh, fantastic, very interesting questions. That comes from you, so thank you all very much for those. And the other thing I, I really do appreciate as we go through these questions is the follow-up that happens throughout the week. Several of you that will text and phone call, make phone calls and discuss these throughout the week. And, you know, I really appreciate that those are continuing discussions, that we don't just take them and let them go and pass it and on to the next one. But there's people that are really, really meditating and thinking about these and really wanting to know what God says about these. And so I really do appreciate the passion our congregation has for seeing what the Bible says uh, about some very, very big uh, topics in our lives. We should explore the Bible. Learn it as best we possibly can. So, this week's question is this. Was Judas acting of his own free will when he betrayed Jesus? There's a lot of debate over whether we as humans have free will or not, and I think a lot stems from different ideas about what free will actually is. When you stop and think about G Judas, what is the thing that sticks out most in your mind? Is it that moment in the garden when he revealed who Jesus is with a kiss? Is it the moment he took his own life? Maybe it's the moments that he was chosen by Jesus and walked with Jesus. I'd say that one's rarer. He's an interesting character for sure. Uh, even, especially in the Gospel of John, we find that John has a very particular thing he wants you to understand about Judas, is that he is not a good person. When John introduces him in uh, John chapter 6, near the end of the chapter, verses 70 and 71, Listen to what he, what he says about that, and you can read along as well. It's a very long chapter, but he says, this is after the disciples were the ones that were sticking with Jesus and choosing to be with him, and many had left at this particular point. Uh, but Jesus has asked them a question, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter's making that proclamation about the identity of Jesus, at least his understanding of it to that particular point, and that would develop over time. But listen to how this contrasts, the next statement, which is, involves Judas, contrasts with Peter's proclamation there. Verse 70, Jesus, Jesus answered them and said, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the 12. John is clearly not pleased with Judas at all. Now, the Gospel of John was actually written decades after these events took place. And so there is a reflective quality about it, and he does have these things that he puts into it. But he doesn't want us to miss the fact that Judas was of a nature that already had a tendency, uh, and, and Jesus was aware of that tendency towards evil, sinfulness. And if you don't pick it up on this one, he gives us his other pretty uh, pointed example in John chapter 12. John doesn't want us to miss it. And it's a, in the midst of a very beautiful moment in which Jesus, again, is being honored. There's a, there's a sense of his identity that's being proclaimed. We'll start in verse 1 of John chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been uh, dead, whom he had raised from the dead, there they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary. Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with his hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, did you see how he just threw that in there? Uh, the one who's going to betray him said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? That's 300 days wages, just to get a scope for how much money we're talking about here. Uh, this is significant uh, fragrance here. And then John tells us, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in, put in it. John wants us to understand that Judas was a flawed character. Now, don't make a mistake and think that all the others were these perfect unflawed characters they all had their things they were dealing with and they all walked with Jesus and they all had these opportunities to develop their character to really listen and take what Jesus is saying and putting into their heart to see the example um, that he gave I mean what a unique 
very unique and powerful and direct influence of Jesus was there. But then we get to that moment in the garden, Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew's account of it, he's given some details that are pretty important. In Matthew chapter 26, we get the moment that's initiated by Judas in verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests. And he said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Now he was well aware that the Pharisees, the scribes, and the chief priests have been after Jesus for some time. Sometimes Jesus would do quite an incredible thing. Or he would give an incredible teaching that would equate him with God. Or he would heal someone on the Sabbath. And their determination to capture him or hurt him or kill him was pretty intense. And these are things that Judas would have been well aware of. So he knows that connection. And he initiates this conversation. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So there is a premeditative element to this. He's made a choice. He took the initiative. And now he's looking for the moment to betray him. He even specifies to them eventually how he's going to do it. In verse 48 of the same chapter, he says, Now his betrayer had given him a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. And immediately in verse 49, he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. And there it is. That moment of betrayal. That moment in which the expectation and the greatness and the glory of Jesus is cast aside by one of his very close followers. Betrayed. So that he would soon go under a very uh, false kind of trial. Unjust trial. That he would be accused of things he did not do. But he would go to the cross and he would pay for the sins. Even of those who had turned against him. But it was at this moment Judas betrayed him. The question is, did he do that of his own free will? Well, what do we mean by free will? And this is what we're going to posit tonight for free will. We're going to go into our discussion groups and break this down, and there's a lot of elements to this, but we're just kind of setting up the character of Judas, the story that's unfolding, and some details of it so that we'll be kind of equipped to go into it. You probably have thoughts of yourself, and you're like, but what about this moment? Sure, bring those up in your discussion groups. What is free will? Well, we're going to work with it. It's the ability of an individual to take action or make thoughts independent of outside elements being circumstances forcing, necessitating a decision. So it's about our ability, our agency, to make decisions for actions or thoughts outside of someone forcing your decision to be made. Now, there could be influences. We know there could be influences. But ultimately, the choice by free will would be that we stand on our own and make those decisions. Adam and Eve in the garden is a fantastic moment of free will. God gave them the entire garden, blessed them immensely. They had a rule, though. They had one rule, and it was don't eat of this particular tree, knowledge of good and evil, choice. Choice is powerful, Choice indicates that God has allowed us to take responsibility for our actions. Choice means he loves us enough that we're not programmed and we're not forced to make decisions. We are presented with the scope of here is the situation that you live in. Here are the consequences if you break the rules that I've given and that were very plainly taught to Adam and Eve. And so they had choice. God gave them that. But then the serpent came. And he influenced that choice. He never forced them, but he influenced that choice. And while he did present a slightly different set of facts than God had given, and while he, as I've said before, his his cunning move was to get them to doubt the word of God, they allowed the outside choice to influence them over top of what God had said. Ooh, it's dangerous ground when that happens. When we allow any influence to shadow over the words of God themselves and we take that influence, we're still responsible for the choice. Oh, Satan's responsible for the lies that he gave and the doubt that he influenced. But we are responsible for our actions to choose to follow God or to choose not to follow God. That's kind of how it breaks down. And from that point forward, mankind's been in the same situation 
James chapter 1 breaks down sort of how that works from our own desires to leading to temptations and our temptations, if we choose to give in to them, lead to sin, lead to sin. But we choose, and so we bear the guilt of sin. Oh, I know sometimes influences do hit us pretty hard. They really do. And sometimes our desires, we allow them to overwhelm us and overcome us sometimes. And we make really bad choices based on really bad information or really bad desires that we didn't uh, take control of. I've always said self-control was the least popular of the fruits of the Spirit. When we recite them, we can really quickly go into love, joy, peace, patience, you know, the others. But there at the end is always self-control. And there in the midst of it is always the idea of personal responsibility. And that's a thing that humans for so long we really have trouble dealing with sometimes. Even Adam and Eve, when God confronted them, what did Adam do? The woman gave it to you. Okay. But you chose to eat of that, Adam. You chose to eat of that. And Eve, what's a serpent? But Eve, you, you chose. You allowed some influence to be greater than the word of God. But the responsibility is always on us and our free will. So Judas, Judas, there was prophecy that there would be a betrayer. You can read about it in Zechariah chapter um, 11, I believe it is, Zechariah chapter 11. And it's fairly, it's fascinating, verses 12 through 13. That should be the easiest thing to remember, 11, 12, 13. So yeah, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. And it's really specific about what's going to unfold there. If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out my wages of 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. And all of that we see unfold. All of that we see unfold in the story of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. Was he forced to do so? Or because of his heart and because of his influence and because of what he set before him, he chose to be that person. I very much think he chose to be that person. If not Judas, someone else would have fulfilled this prophecy. Could Judas have changed the prophecy? No. Could jo Judas have changed the, the plan of God? No. He simply chose how he would participate in it. And he chose to be the betrayer. It's a reminder for us of our own personal responsibility and our ability to choose. What a great gift God's given us. And examples like this remind us, choose wisely. If I may quote Indiana Jones, choose wisely who you're going to follow. Choose wisely what influences you let into your life. Choose wisely the voice that you will allow to dictate your path. There's a reason the Bible is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We choose to follow God's word above all things. When all these influences bear down on us, it's our free will that allow us to consider them, no matter how big they may seem, and recognize how small they are and need to be in our lives compared to God's word and his immense love and his great care and what he wants to do for us. Don't compromise. The message that we get from Judas is don't compromise. There's a lot that can be discussed in that tonight, and I'm really excited for us to spend that time in it. But we get choice. God's blessed us with choice. You are not forced. Influenced? Yeah. Whether by your own desires or some outside force. But God allows you to make the choice. Choose wisely. Tonight you have free will to recognize your relationship with God. Tonight we throw it out as we do each week. And some people say, why, why do you keep doing that? Because your choice matters. Your choice of how you want to pursue God and who you can be in Jesus, through Jesus, because of Jesus, it really matters. You choose. God has done all the impossible work that we can't, we can't free ourselves from sin. We can't pay for our sins. We can't earn our salvation. But Jesus chose to go to the cross and pay for our sins. And God laid out a path where we could be free from our sins through obeying the gospel, which means we have faith. In the word, it means we repent from our sins. We turn away from that which is opposed to God and turn to uh, what would draw us closer to God, what pleases him. We commit to a life dedicated to him. Commit to it. Uh, that God is going to be the one we serve for the entirety of our life with every breath we have. We choose that. We choose it. We acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, not just some man. 
not just some man. And we choose to be baptized for the remission of our sins. And in that point, by faith, Jesus' blood will wash away our sins and we will be, you will be, a new creature, a new creation, a new life. You can choose that tonight. We ask it every week because it's that important. And we want you to know that with every breath you have, you need to be thinking about that choice and choose wisely. Let the right things influence you. Let the will of God sit deep in your heart. Choose God. If we can help you in that tonight, let us know as we stand and as we sing.